Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 27 of the Tomato Timer, where we're kind of like messing around with some new technology. And hopefully this is a better experience for you guys. Um, today, joining me is a data analyst. She's working in KPMG, Lean Madanat. Uh, it's so cool to have you. How are you, Lean? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's 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 OK. It's kind of like a few of my I have only one more exam left, so I'm feeling a bit more relaxed. Um, yeah. But and, and it's like kind of the end of my degree, so it's exciting. So, Lean, you know, most of the time I ask um, my guests, you know, how did you start? Where were you? How was your like school life? But the weird thing is that I kind of know exactly what your school life was like because we went to the same school. Um, we were there for many, many years, but you moved away around a level at GCSE times, right? Where did you go? Yeah, so I moved to Jordan just before that, just before uh, high school started. Um, where I went to King's Academy, which is a semi-boarding school. It's a full boarding school, but I was a half board. So I was went to a okay. boarding school, one of the first in the Middle East. So that was a really interesting experience. Wow. What, what did it feel like? Because I don't think many of us have gone to boarding schools. Yeah. So boarding school was amazing. It teaches you things about yourself that you wouldn't learn otherwise. Mm -hmm. Independence was a big one. Um, and I think it really pushes you to be super independent and you kind of are in this academic zone almost all the time because you live with your teachers. They're your mentors, they're your friends, they're your teachers at the same time. So yeah. you really have to have that relationship that you might not otherwise have um, at like a, a daily school. So that's a difference uh, that boarding school made. And I think it made me ready for university like um, really quickly. So I didn't yeah. feel transition was tough because I actually moved away from university, moved away from home. Yeah, that's true because obviously when I came in my first year, I could not work out like how I was going to cook and how I was going to manage my household and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure that going to a boarding school like really gave you that independent feeling right right at the start. Yeah, exactly. So you just had to figure it out yourself. So you didn't study A-levels and GCSEs. You then went on to the AP system. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. It was the AP, which is Advanced Placement, which is the American system, um, mm -hmm. the U.S. version. And uh, I did some physics APs. I did um, English and history. I really liked that, which is totally opposite of what I do now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I also did the stats and economics, which helped. Okay. And so with your APs, where did you end up going to study? And what yeah. did you study? Um, yeah, the, this is a long one. And those who... Uh, listen to this whole one, they're really patient. <laughs> so I did a major in physical science, which is a combination of math, physics, and comp sci. Mm -hmm. And then did a minor in math and business administration because uh, business is something really important. And I think even if you do a pure STEM major, having that business aspect is, is really good. So taking economics, management, uh, et cetera. So I mix that in with science. And then... That still doesn't sound very data AI stuff, though, right? What, where did that start to play in, in your kind of like thought process and your kind of career progression then, I guess? Yeah. So this is really interesting because one um, notion right now is that most professionals in the data field need to have a master's or a PhD to kind of pursue the, the data science field or data analytics or business intelligence. Mm -hmm. But I've actually found my way into the field uh, in a totally opposite direction, I guess. And and those who are not going through the traditional master's degree program to get into a job in data science, I think will follow this a similar route or will, will understand what I'm saying. Um, having a STEM background, so computer science based, uh, analytics, uh, statistics, those skills are very essential to data science. So if you have a background in STEM and all you learn is how to analyze data or um, put it in simpler forms is do different types of research and that's essentially what it is so being able to gather information that's relevant to what you're looking for which is honestly also what you learn in university in general right you were yeah. looking for the correct information placing it in the right place and analyzing it in a way that makes sense to the problem that we have at hand um, those skills really helped me get into the field um, but what pushed me, I guess, to realize, okay, data analytics is a field that I want to be in, is my internships. Um, actively seeking um, business experience rather than only academic research is really what got me into it, I would say. Um, so it made me realize that I had those skills that I wouldn't have been able to give you this answer, I guess, maybe three years ago, because I wouldn't have realized it if I didn't take the internships I did. Yeah. So what were those internships and what sort of projects were you working on at the time? 
Mm -hmm. So one of the first ones that got me into just coding in the workplace is one in Jordan at Intelesk, which is a computer uh, software company. So they were building like management software tools, et cetera, for businesses. And one of them is the UAE government. So um, learning from them how they use code to make processes more efficient is very different from learning CompSci in uni where you were making a game using Python just to learn how Python works, for example. Yeah. So taking the skills, it's very different. That's actually one of the questions I got asked is, how's, how is code different from university and in, in business? And that's how, it is, how it's different. You were able to take the skills that you might have learned used for other different projects and kind of detect what skills are useful and then put them into into business and see how they can be efficient. So that was one of my first experiences. But the most impactful one for me was at PepsiCo in Dubai. And Ooh, that's really cool. What were they what were you doing there? Yeah. So there I actually interned with the HR team, so the t- talent acquisition team, but I did um, talent acquisition analytics. So it was super, super cool because I got to kind of design my own project alongside a professional mm-hmm in talent analytics, which is very, very specific and niche. And honestly, going into it, I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, it was my third year of uni and I still was confused about what field I wanted to go into. And then um, mm. when I landed into that internship, I realized, okay, I can use the skills I learned from physics. I can learn, I can use the skills I learned from coding and comp sci and stats to understand this problem. And what we looked into was Um, what were the key factors affecting the hiring process for PepsiCo in Australia? So it was super interesting. We looked at many factors like GPA, years of experience, previous uh, um, organizations that these candidates were at to try and figure out what factors affect success in the hiring process. So seeing my work or maybe small pieces of code, um, Mm. statistical analysis, go into something that will affect a global talent acquisition team that for me sparked a a really big interest in how data can affect people and how that can make our lives either more ethical or um, understand why things happen better or um, just kind of reason through things in a logical way and i was just i just fell in love with it after that and i i committed to learning more about data analytics learning tools on my own time um, mm. and then eventually landing a career in, in data analytics. So um, I know from experience at uni myself, because I had lots of friends kind of trying to tap into the, the big four consulting firms and, and banks and all that kind of stuff with internships and, and conversion processes. I don't know. I, I never got into that. I, I heard a lot. I heard a lot about these like really intense psychometric tests and all that kind of stuff. Um, how did you go about landing a job at KPMG, which is like one of the big fours, you know, it's it's a it's not that easy to get there, especially in a in the career that you chose, which is data and AI innovation. Yeah, I think the before talking about like interview processes or people and conversations and knowing how to introduce yourself, the biggest thing for me was having a support system that gave me more confidence in myself than I had. So someone or mentor or friends or family that really push you and tell you, okay, even though this is hard, even though you might not be the best at what you're doing and you're still learning, have Mm -hmm. that confidence to say, okay, I don't know this, but I will learn. And that's why I want to be in the field. And I think that's what helped me big time um, in first landing the, my first job, which wasn't KPMG, which was at um, a local uh, company called Dubai Holding. And within it, I was at Global Village, which is an entertainment company. Company. So I did data science in customer analytics and in a sort of like um, a theme park. <laughs> and that was my first Ooh. first job. And yeah. getting into it, I, I was really scared at first because I had this idea about what I knew and I had a couple of projects under my belt. But being in business, doing these things and having someone trust you with, the, with information that's, that's also, um, I guess, sensitive was scary. But kept trying to convince myself okay Lynn, you have the confidence to do it so just push through you have the skills these people clearly hired you because you know what you're talking about so I guess talking to yourself and giving yourself that confidence um like even a pep talk. Skills. yeah exactly even if you don't have the skills, <laughs> you can learn them you know there are multiple ways to learn things from people from online um, so for me the way 
I got through to finally end up at KPMG is have that confidence to take baby steps before. And also um, something that's different, not a lot of people would might agree with this, but I didn't get through um, to KPMG with a graduate program. Mm-hmm. I actually entered the field just applying to a regular job. Um, and a recruiter actually reached out to me for this job. And it's, I guess, mostly because I had a tiny bit of experience beforehand. So my biggest, um, I guess, factor for this was knowing how to talk the talk in the field. So yeah. I had a couple of months, probably like nine, um, in my first full-time job, and then two or three internships beforehand in the field. So not everyone knows what they want to do. But if you have an instinct about something, at least try internships or um, online courses or something like that beforehand so that you kind of have something to fall back on in terms of knowledge Mm. when you talk about something. Because um, when we graduate university, we don't really know what we want to do. (laughs) Right? That's true. We don't know the lingo of the industry. We don't know... um, certain like trigger points for for recruiters because after I got into it I realized okay I think I said the right thing because I've heard someone in my previous job say it yeah and it seems very important so um you start to know how to talk the lingo and and also you start to realize what's important for management because data analytics is a field that's important to many many industries now for ranging from marketing to pharmaceuticals to to healthcare um Pretty much everywhere, everywhere there is some sort of place where data is being collected, you need a data analyst to make sense of the data. Exactly. So realizing that any t- any management or stakeholder or client that you're talking to might have an angle to what you're saying. Would really yeah. So kind of my biggest advice is to understand the other side. So try. So if you're talking to a recruiter or an interview or having an interview with a certain manager at a certain firm know what kind of industry they came back they came from so kind of do your research yeah. and then find out how what you are passionate about applies to that industry that gives you an edge in terms of okay they might not fully know how to implement what they're saying but they do have the interest and knowledge and research to back them up and then learn how to do it so there's a lot of factors that go to, into it from your confidence to the support you have um, to the amount of effort you put into research beforehand so I think um, all of these play a factor, and out of all of these, I would pick confidence because that's the, one of the biggest things. And one of the things that uh, it's actually linked to confidence, it's mindset, right? Um, you said that you didn't get into the big four right out of graduate school. And that sometimes, like for a lot of us, you know, we, when we face our first failure, we're like, ah, damn it, now I'm never going to do this again. And you had a completely different approach to it. You actually said, I want to go out, I want to find anything that's relevant to my field and something that will build me as a pro- in my profile, in my career, and as a person. So you you learned the lingo, you learned um, what the management was looking for, you learned about how to how to kind of like give off the kind of the confidence and the the knowledge that you were bringing. You know, you, were, you weren't just someone who'd come out from an academic space who knew a couple of things about data and AI, but you'd never played in, you know, you'd never been in industry. You have that combination of or first job internships, and that's really powerful. I think uh, I'm, I'm just kind of reiterating because it's uh, I, I want to believe it myself and put it instill, my, instill it in my own approach and my own working. Um, the ability to kind of like make steps towards kind of like vector towards the direction you want to go rather than just say, you know, if I don't get there, that's it. That's the end of wherever I wanted to go. Yeah, exactly. So let me let me take it now. You know, you're you're working um, as a data and analytics consultant at KPMG. What is your role kind of involved? What are you working on a day to day basis? And how has the virus, the COVID kind of lockdown situation affected you? Yeah, sure. So um, currently, in my role at KPMG, I'm in the data analytics team, which is mm-hmm. a team of around 22 professionals, ranging from data science to business intelligence tools and uh, basically implementing a whole uh, and the advanced analytics solution for clients. So my my day-to-day job involves um, a lot of um, designing data solutions, implementing data strategies that have been developed. So for mm-hmm. example, implementing data warehouses, implementing business intelligence tools that showcase the firm's data in a way that's important for managers to make decisions. So it ranges from perspective 
prescriptive to descriptive analytics. Um, so it ranges from you learning about your historical data to make future decisions, or yeah. using current data to um, foresee what might happen in the future. So it's both, uh, I think the biggest thing we do is data-driven, fueling data-driven decision-making. So understanding data, um, clarifying data sources, uh, implementing data sources that will be important for, for certain decisions to be made, um, understanding current situations. This one's really interesting, using data. So um, identifying what sources are already there um, that mm -hmm. give really important data that has just been untapped. So a lot of organizations um, might not be mature in the way they analyze their data or um, find their data. And so we help them navigate through that. And it's it's really tough when an organization is not mature in their data strategy. Um, so that's where we come in and kind of simplify that process, provide that strategy yeah. and then implement it um, to give them kind of clarity. It's kind of like walking through the woods and then finally finding an answer. Or, mm. um, so that's kind of what we do. And, and, and what about the lockdown? Like, I, I know it's affected a lot of people. What, how has it affected your job? So I've been at KP, KPMG for around five months now. So I, or four, yeah, around that four to five. And at first it was very like um, client-based. Like I was going to work, I was going to the office, etc. So after the lockdown, it was fully work at home, work from home. Yeah. And what's really interesting is that I felt like our work tripled, like no joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, I never felt so busy and pressured um, in a good way though because data analytics is on the rise we see that in its importance with COVID-19 and spreading the correct information um, I mean when you google the number of cases in a certain country that data source has to be really accurate and behind it are people who drive that um, to make people sure like that you. <laughs> to make sure there's a single source of truth for a government, for a country, um, for the World Health Organization. So these numbers have to come from a single source of truth. And that's a, that's one of the things that you hear data analytics specialists say all the time, that their goal is to have a source of truth for information. And that mm -hmm. only happens if you have the technology and advanced analytics in the background that um, is ethical and that is built correctly, the security is in place. So all those things play a factor in data analytics. And um, due to the current situation, every company became hyper aware of their data analytics processes. Yeah. And so they are reaching out for help with data strategy. They are reaching out for help with data science use cases. So um, management has questions on their mind that they want to answer. And the, and the only way they kind of find um, a reliable way to answer it is not through experience, but through statistical modeling and experiment. Yeah, Evidence-based. Exactly. So management are asking questions. Like how can we prove this? Okay, we can prove it by trial and error, or we can prove it by looking at the past data that we have and see what mm. we can do or see what hypotheses we can come up with. So yeah. it's really cool because we're, we're really invo involved in that brainstorming session um, with clients, as well as... Um, implementing them and so we got really really busy the past couple of months <laughs> yeah. and and what about the kind of the whole space of data analytics is it do you think it's growing and uh, how, like how is it all going to be like for yeah. like incoming you know we're, we're some of us are at a level some of us are gcses and if we're like interested in this field should we be should we be happy or should we be excited to see a lot more jobs coming up in that area oh 100 percent um when I was graduating, I was hearing that jobs were doubling every day that were available online. Jo like jobs were being posted every other day and if not every day. So it was a very exciting field to come into because I knew there was a lot to apply to. And I yeah. think it still applies for data analytics because it's starting to um, divide into kind of mini specialties. So there's no longer a data scientist. It's going to be uh, a machine learning engineer, a data architect, a solution architect, um, a BI specialist. Um, a data analyst specifically for a certain um, industry because data scientists now um, are starting to specialize in certain industries. Mm. So it ranges from engineers to architects. To, so it's, it's starting to become a more mature field. And yeah. with that comes even more jobs because yeah. people realize that it's not just a big one 
job title data scientist it has so many different aspects and no data scientist knows all of those aspects it's very difficult to have expertise in in data engineering and, and being a solution architect and being a bi developer and visualization specialist because yeah. it's really hard to have all of those at once and no employer should ever expect a, a person to have all of these skills at once so it's starting to to become really specialized and maturing and this is a great time to be in it because of the fact yeah. that right now well it's crazy because like when we were at school i don't think uh, a job title like that even existed even data scientist wasn't a job title that existed so the fact that it's it's literally come about in the past you know five five six ten years um and not only that but it's actually finally getting refined too because one of the things that's really tough about a really really you know infant industry or infant um field is the fact that as you said you know people are expected to do everything uh, you know you just because you're a data scientist you should also be good at visualizing all the data we're getting into a nice pretty graph and you're also very you also need to know a lot more about the the, the biological reasons of the virus and because of that find Im implications in the data it's good to hear that finally you're actually getting uh that refinement in the roles that you have and that means of course that the roles are just going to continue to increase and expand yeah, I agree. And, and some people say that eventually our jobs will be replaced by robots and all of that stuff. <laughs> but that's really not true. You need a human to make decisions. You need a human to interfere. Um, our perspectives matter. Our ethics matter. Our morals matter, especially with jobs and data. So mm. I definitely see it as a, as a sector that's going to grow. Cool. So I want to talk about one more thing. Uh, before we kind of get to the end, uh, I want to talk about this glass ceiling that you mentioned in your biography. Um, and we've talked a lot about this because amazingly, the, the number of so many of our guests have come in and are females. And we've, we've talked a lot about women in STEM and women in data science. And, and I wanted to hear your perspective, because not only have you kind of you are a role model for, for females who are looking to apply for role jobs and roles like in data science, but you you actually started an initiative. Um, 500 women in science, 500 million, 500, yeah. Wait. 500. Uh, and so tell us a little bit about that. Like yeah. wh how did it all start and where, what's your role in it? Yeah. So 500 women scientists is a global organization, um, aimed at, uh, supporting and, uh, influencing women in STEM to kind of be, um, more confident in their fields, give them mentors, um, inspire those who are interested to be in STEM but um, don't know really what they're doing. Mm. Um, and it's more to kind of close, close the gender gap when it comes to STEM research um, and in business as well. Because many times women feel like they're the only woman in the boardroom or meeting room in, in yeah. when it comes to science and technology. So um, one thing that 500 Women Scientists does is fuel local chapters of the main organization that started in Colorado in the U.S., Yep. And so I started the local pod for Dubai, where um, I have around 20 members now and growing. Wow. And we have, um, like 10 committed members who are going to help me grow uh, 500 women scientists here um, mm -hmm. by having webinars, talks with women in the field, um, by uh, having kind of mentorship programs that I'm planning um, and kind of giving women the support that they need in order to succeed, succeed in fields that they might have not had the opportunity to enter. I yeah. mean, um, a lot of women in the U.S. and Europe and Middle East study STEM fields, but employment rates in the field still hover at around 30 percent. So Gosh. there's a disconnect between what where what women are are passionate about and what they're studying, and then the fields that they're actually granted access to. So mm. that's the glass ceiling that I aim to kind of shatter. <laughs> shatter. Yeah, um, <laughs> Lean. It's it's been so good to have you, and we could talk forever. Um, but we have a Pomodoro, we have 25 minutes. And now as we come to the end of the episode, we want to kind of have a key takeaway, uh, a thing that we should be thinking about to take away from your talk about, you know, something we should be working at or, or I know you've said so many amazing kind of pieces of advice and, and valuable insights. So what would you say is a key takeaway for us today? I think the biggest takeaway I would say is... Um, Try to eliminate bias in whatever you do. Um, it's going to be super hard. You're going to challenge yourself. You're going to challenge people around you. Um, and try to be the most confident 
you can be at the moment you're in. So don't try to stress yourself out to be super confident in what you do, but really put in the effort to, to be proud of where you've come from and where, how far you've come, no matter where you are. So I think the, the biggest thing is be confident um, and be aware of the biases that exist in the world that could affect your journey, but also um, be active in that, you know? Mm. Um, so yeah, those are, I guess are my two big takeaways. Amazing. And eliminating bias is a very data scientist um, <laughs> takeaway to give. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank you to all our listeners for coming in live and hopefully listening to this offline as well. Um, and that's all for today. And we'll join you next week. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye bye. Cool. <laughs> Breathe.